So I learned at a young age that I love knowledge and I love wisdom, no matter what form it came in. And from there, you know, a star was born, you feel me? Like, I was just like, I, I, I understood the streets. I understood how to delegate. I understood how to be a sponge. And that's when I started to figure out who I really was. It, it's, it, when you look at me and you see me right now, this has always been my vision for myself. 1,000, the only thing, and, and you know, I've got a little ice on because I'm running around today, but plain Jane watch, wedding band, plain Jane, clean shirt, you know, nice slacks. That's what I wanted to be because that's what I respected. I, I've been around, you know, every gangster you can name. You know what I'm saying? I've been in every hood there was, but I understood one thing. The people that we couldn't understand was the people that were smart enough to create these Fortune 500 companies for themselves and be able to do it legitimately. And that's where that symbolized me. I always wanted to be a black man that, you know, understood what his passion was and, and what what his what, what what drives him. You know what I'm saying? Like my purpose. And a lot of people don't know that. Like music is my talent, and I'll get into that later, but business has always been my passion. Because I want to walk in the room and I want that respect, not just being the hustler to be, you know, the gangster to be the person who put in the work, you know what I'm saying? But I mean, like, when you walk in the rooms, people respect you because they know you know how to make moves and you know how to put, you know, the community together so everybody plays a position, and that's what I want. You know, being an entrepreneur, that's what hustling taught me because I ran it like a business. I understood it like a business. I, I treated my people that worked for me and with me like employees. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what I was mocking it at. I didn't know any better. I just know how business was ran. And for me, wanting to be that guy is almost like you took a, a position of leadership without even knowing it yet. You know, I was a natural born leader, you know, when I was birth. But instead of leaving my cousins, you know, to break in this, the neighbor's swimming pool, now I was leaving my, my, my hood to actually like, you know, living a better life. And that entailed being a CEO on the low, you know what I'm saying? And, and handle it like that. Like, there's a lot of things that I didn't do around people that was getting busy with me. Like, I didn't drink. I didn't smoke, you know what I'm saying? I didn't let them see me indulging in things because I just wanted to always keep that respect. I talked to them, but I kept it on the surface. You know what I'm saying? I didn't let my right hand know what my left hand was doing. For a long time, if I'm keeping honest, I don't even think I told people this, but my whole scheme was I was always the man, but I would run the game on the OGs and the big homies. Like, okay, y'all give me y'all money and, I, and I, I'll go get it for you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I already had it. So they just give me their money, you know, and I go, you know, my grandma house, eat some cereal, chill out for a minute, and then I come back with the bag. You know what I mean? That was my hustle, but I already had it, you know, because the people that was older than me that was looking out for me, they trusted me enough to let me do whatever. I mean, in the beginning, it was like, um, I was with my parents, of course. Um, my father was in the military. A lot of people don't know that. You know, he married my mom young. They was both out the hood. My father went to the military to kind of take care of the fam. Um, I was already born, of course. So at a young age, I moved around. I lived in um, Hawaii um, for a few, and I lived in Japan. And um, as I got a little older, I would go off base to uh, like steal things to send them back to the States to make money. I was, you know, maybe nine, 10, and I got kicked off the island, so I had to go back to live with my grandmother. So when I went back to my grandmother in the hood, you know, reality kicked in because I'm back in the hood now. And I was just living with my dad and everything was, you know, it was cool. Well, my dad and my mom separated and I had to live with my, uh, I went back to live with my mom 
But um, at the time, we just bumped heads a lot because I was learning who I was and I was um, in the streets at a young age. So she wasn't cool with that. And, and me and my mom lived in a, a single wide trailer with my sister. It was like a single wide trailer. Like it's, you know, probably all of, you know, a thousand square feet. And the trailer was basically $3,500. And I had already hustled up the money to give her for the trailer. Um, and I basically paid for it. And she wondered where I got the money from, but I was helping my uncle at the time do roofing. And I was acting like I was saving the money, but I was going out and I was hustling. And um, she basically gave me an ultimatum. Like, you know, if you're not going to vibe by my rules, you got to go live with your grandmother. And I went back to live with my grandmother. And, and that's when reality just hit. You know what I mean? Like, it was like, I, I got to fend for myself. People are born with a set of talents and skills that they might not know until they practice it. I think for me, I was born with discipline. I was born with ambition, like I feel it. Like, like I'm st I still have a fire in my stomach to this day because I know I get up every day and give it everything I got and I don't have a product to sell. I'm basically going out here with my ideas and making things happen. And that's what you do when you're ambitious. The discipline comes in because I seen so many people lose it all, including their freedom and their life. I don't pay for more funerals than you can even count. It got to one point, like, you know, everybody around me was pretty much dead in jail. So to me, I understood the consequences of what I was doing was death or jail. I didn't want either. So that entailed for me to be smart. That entailed for me to be a learner. That entailed for me to be a listener. And that entailed for me to go into a room and be able to um, just play the position of, you know, a follower and not let everybody know that you're the head of the table. You know what I'm saying? It really took that. It dawned on me, just like, you know, when I started seeing a lot of my friends go to prison, I'm just sitting back and I'm like, what can I do with my life that I can honestly do, and I could do it well, because I wanted to put my sisters through school, through college, which I did, and I wanted to get my mom out the hood and buy a house, which I did. I bought my mom like three houses. And the only thing I could think of was music, because it came from the hood. The hood basically championed whoever was the realist, and I understood that I had the tools to let people know that this is the life I'm really living if you guys want the real. So it was a real risk because the things that I was speaking on was actually the truth. And a lot of people thought I was dry snitching, or I was saying too much, but I'm not a carpenter. I can't tell you about fixing the roofs. I'm not a mechanic. I can't tell you about the cars, but I'm a hustler. I can tell you everything you want to know about the streets. And what I entailed was I took a little bit out of Tupac's book. So instead of me just saying, you know, ignorant things, I would talk about things that I really believed in. And that's where the thug motivation and all that came from because I actually felt like I was giving back and helping people that didn't see life like that. You know what I'm saying? When I grew up in this single wide trailer with my mother, all the $3,500, the one thing I did have is a, a radio. And every morning before school, I would play Master P, Tupac, The Brat. It was like a religion. That's the only thing that got me going in the morning was music. I was actually learning from, from the music, and which is one reason why I really love Tupac's accord because he was ahead of his time. He, he was a revolutionary. So the things that he said to me, they resonated well because he had morals and integrity. Like he was willing to die for what he believed in. And to me, I found that fascinating because everybody where I was at was just living to die for nothing. And it was just like, he he took a stance on, this is what I believe in. And I never heard that before because coming from where I came from, nobody believed in <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You know, nobody really had jobs. Nobody really had money. Nobody really was thinking about, you know, the community or the culture. Like, I never heard that from my parents and my uncles. Like, you got to take care of your people. Or you got to stand for something. Like, it wasn't that. Everybody was just so happy to have a little bit they had. 
and to be able to live that they didn't they didn't want to fight for it. And I love that he fought for it. So I learned what I learned through music. Actually, Tupac died. That was the last time I ever cried. I'll never forget it. My cousin Goldmouth came in the room. I'm at my grandmother's house. I'm sleeping in the back room. I finally got my money up. I got a, a safe in the closet. You know, I got my own, you know, thing going because she built an extension onto her house with some money I gave her, of course. And my cousin knocked on the door. He's like, yo, you heard what happened to your boy? And I was like, oh. He's like, turn on the news. And I saw it, and I was just like, you know, I, I never felt like that. I felt like, you know, like, like my brother had died. You know what I mean? Because I believe everything he stood for. And I was just like, why would they kill someone um, that was for the people? And it's so crazy, like, you know, not to jump, um, not to jump on, but everybody that I've known this guy killed in this game that we in, they were always for the people. You know, they the ones that end up getting taken out. And um, and not to compare, but I never felt nothing like that before. And, and it almost made me heartless. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's where my heart froze. You know, and Tupac morals and rules still in my head today. Like I, I, I told my son, he was like, I want to rap. I said, well, are you willing to die for it? Because it, it takes that. Like, you're not just doing this for money. You have to know that. You know. Are you on GC straight ahead? It starts that I have influence, and that's that, that's what it's really about. Influence. I had influence because I was a stand-up guy. And people know that I was really getting money. You know what I'm saying? I was really in the hood. I was really on the block. You know what I mean? And I had influence because I was helping other people get money. So I'm showing them all this stuff, and this is how it starts. It starts with me believing in myself, you know, start, start, and I, I modeled myself after cash money, and then I had a, some homeboys who ended up going to the feds. They was from Fort Lauderdale. They had a group called SOP. And, you know, it was basically street guys, and they was trying to rap. And then I went to their studio, and they had this dope studio, and I'm just like, man, I could get one of these. So I went back to Atlanta and bought me a studio. So then I went back and grabbed some some um, homies from the hood and um, made a group. And then just sure enough, I was investing all my money in it. One got locked up for murder. The other one got locked up for something else. And then the other one was just really strung out on drugs real bad. So I basically was stuck with a studio with no artist and I had tied all my money up in it. I was really out and the thing was, I was always sitting in the studio with them. I would be in there more than they would be. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was more dedicated to them than them. So I started doing songs, but I was a little shy at first. And I remember, I remember telling myself, I'm going to figure this out. So my first couple projects was, you know, they was, they, they, they was what, I, what I heard other people do. Like, I didn't have my own identity. And I just remember one day, one of my partners was just like, man, why don't you just tell them about what you got going on in real life? So I just went to the studio and I just really sat down and, and did some just some reflecting and was like, yo, man, I'm just gonna talk about my life and everything I got going on. And I knew that what I had that people didn't have was I really had the streets. So I had all the chicks in Magic City and all these strip clubs because I knew them personally. And I just go in there, stand in the corner, and God bless the dead. Um, my partner, DJ Fernando, was the DJ there. And me and him got cool, you know what I'm saying? Later on, he ended up getting killed. Somebody killed him at his house when he was getting outside his car. And he told me one time before, he's like, yo, be cool, because somebody gonna kill you out here. And he ended up getting killed before me. Long story short, um, and I would go in the club and he would just like champion what I was doing. You know what I'm saying? And then slowly but surely, the girls got involved in it because I was tipping them well. And the next thing you know, like, Magic City was my, was my hub. And if you know anything about Magic City, you gotta know that every hustler from every state, every city, every country, every gang member comes to this club when they come to Atlanta because it's like business central. And I said, if I can get these people in here to believe in what I'm doing, then I got something. And sure enough, that's when it starts sparking. I go in there and you know the girls be dancing to my songs and the next time I come in there, a few people be in there and start singing some verses from my mixtapes and um, it just started from there, and I, I was like, you know what? I got Magic City, but if I can get Magic City, I can get the rest of Atlanta. So what I would do was, it was a club on the east side, and they had Sunday night. So I would go press up, 
you know, three, 4,000 CDs on my mixtape and go there every Sunday and just pass them out to everybody and put them on everybody's windshield. And I did that for like six months. And that's why I got my first show book there. So they call me and it was like, yo, who's the artist? But I'm telling, I'm acting like I'm the manager, it's me though. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, he got out here. Y'all want to book him, this is what it's going to cost. And I played him. I was like, you know what I'm saying? I was like, y'all, 500, he there. It was like, yeah, 500, cool. So they gave me 500 for my first show. So I went through there. I did a show. Of course, it was terrible. And I never forget, you know, I'm a street guy. I'm trying to come up. So I try to take it to the west side. And I go in the club, and it's a club called The Bounce. And of course, this is the side of town, T. Oswald. So I go in the club, you know what I'm saying? They like, you know, I pay them to let me open up. So I come out, you know, I do my two, three songs, nobody move, and I never forget. I just hear him get on the mic, it's the king, homie. I'm like, oh, So he come out and he do uh, 20 folds. And the whole club going crazy. And I just remember sitting there and I just left. I was like, man, I got some more work to do. And um, I went back in, that's what I did, Trap or Die. You know what I'm saying? And I did the same thing. I went and passed it out and gave it away because my whole mentality was I'm going to put my heart and soul in this music because I might end up going to prison or I might not be living to, for people to know what I'm talking about anyway. So this is my only shot. And I'm going to give it to anybody that wants to hear it because I know it's just like the streets. If you give out good product, they're going to come back. And that was my whole thing. I passed out from Trap or Die. I probably gave away about two, 300,000 CDs. Yeah. Well, I'll never forget, I, we were shooting um, a Blue Da Vinci video, and um, Fab, who I had met in Magic City, um, we was out there and they were shooting this video for Blue, and, and Fab was like, um, actually, he played he played me Breathe. That was the first time I heard Breathe. He played it in the car for me. I was like, yo, this is crazy. And then he was like, I was like, I got a studio session. You know what I'm saying? He was like, yo, I got this song I'm working on. I don't have a hook for it. You know, he played me do the damn thing. And I was like, he was like, he just want a hook. But in my mind, I was like, okay, I'm gonna put this hook on there, but I'm gonna put me a verse on here too. So by the time he came back in the room, I put my hook and my verse on it. And so he couldn't say no. And that was like the first feature, I, like the first major feature I got. And um, and when they came in the room, all of them heard and they went crazy. So that was going on simultaneously. Kim Porter hit me and Ebony hit me because they knew my cousin the one that was running the city before. And he had just got out of the feds. And um, she's like, yo, we want to get you in this group. And I'm like, all right, what, what group is this? She was like, it's a group we're doing for Puff. I'm like, all right, cool, I'm going to come by the studio. So I go up to the studio. Of course, I pull up in the Ferrari. And we go in the room, and um, Trick Daddy there, Jazzy Faye there, Big Zach, and, and of course, the group. And they introduced me to everybody. And um, they working on them boys. And I'm like, all right. So I went in the booth and I was like, this is the song we're working on. I'm like, all right, cool. So I go in there. So it takes me a while because I got to feel the room because I really don't know everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I wasn't that cool with tricking them yet. So I go in there and I'm, I'm writing my verse. You know, I hear everybody talking. Why are you taking them so long? He's supposed to be hot. Oh, ooh, all this going on. And they actually leave the room because I'm taking so long. So then what I would do is I would, I would, when I got in the booth, I would break up my, my cadences so that I can put my ad libs and then fill ins in because that's what gave me my sauce. But I also, that's what I did because I didn't know how to record. You know what I'm saying? So when I got done, I went in the hallway and I liked to have them turn it all the way up and listen to it in the hallway so I could hear the sonics. By the time I said bring a stack, everybody in that studio was standing in that hallway in a maze. Like, what in the f you know what I mean? Like, everybody was tripping. And you know, to me, I'm just like, are they bugging? Like, they just, you know what I mean? Like, they just really want me in the group. And I didn't understand. But when they played the whole verse, I just saw it on everybody's face. They were just like, yo, he the truth. He really know what he talking about. And they let it play on the radio like it was just a regular song. And that's how I got over it, because nobody had ever heard that. And I just remember tricking them, sitting me down. I was just like, like what are you doing with these mixtapes? And jazzing them. I was like, I'm giving them away. It's like, man, that's the biggest mistake you ever made in your life, giving your music away. And I stand here today to say that businessman in me to get here where I'm at told me back then that that was gonna be the best decision I ever made. Because right now, today, I could stand on any stage and do those same songs because I built 
real belief in the people who really rock with me because I gave them what I had. And that goes back to what my grandmother always told me. If you ever want somebody to do something for you, do something for them first. How I met Puff was one of my partners threw his birthday party at, at Justin's, and Puff was the host, and he had been hearing about me. And so he came, um, he, he was hosting the party, and he had the same watch on, and we was tripping about that. And we just chopped it up real quick, you know what I'm saying, just kept it player. But as time went on, I would just like see him places. And, and this was about the time I was actually going to sign the Boys in the Hood, so we went to New York with the group. So when we sat in there, I just kept I kept telling, I was like, yo, I'm gonna do the deal, but I'm only gonna do one album. And then this is what I want, you know what I'm saying? By this time, Def Jam is trying to sign me and the Boys in the Hood thing's happening because I'm on the record now, you know what I'm saying? So simultaneously, I negotiated two deals by myself. I didn't even have a lawyer. Cause now Kevin Lyle signed me to Def Jam and he was signing me to Def Jam and he was on his way out and I didn't know it. And Jay-Z became the new president. At the same time, I was doing the bad boy deal. So Puff and Jay cool. So now I'm like telling Jay that I'm gonna do this and telling Puff that I'm gonna tell Jay I'm gonna do that. So anyway, we did the deal. And I never forget, Puff called me like, maybe like 20 times one night. It was like a Monday. So I'm going to Magic City Monday. You know what I'm saying? I just got, got my 911 outs, white on white, about to hit Magic City up. And Puff called me like a hundred times. He was like, yo, Jeezy, go to Kinko's, get the contract, sign it, and fax it back to me. And I'm like, yo, man, I'm about to go in the club. I'm not about to sign no contract and send it back through Kinko's. And he kept calling, kept calling. And we laugh about it all the time. So I love music because everything I ever learned that was life changing for me came from music. I understood it was a vehicle when it took me around the world and it connected me with people that I would have never been connected with. And I was able to do things that I wouldn't have normally been able to do because now I got a different type of influence. But also morally, I understand that I'm is a position of leadership as well. So I can't just do it and get the money and not have the integrity. You know what I'm saying? But I do love music. Right now, today, I listen to any genre you can think of. You know what I mean? My homeboys leave my house on the weekend because I want to leave. I want to listen to, you know, loose ends and, you know, all that because I grew up on that when I was with my uncles. But then I can go all the way up to, you know, to Lil Dirt. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm all in between. Like, and I love music. I love to make music because of my form of art. But at the same time, I think that God had a bigger plan for me because I know a lot of people that do music got caught up and they're not here anymore. And I've been in those same situations, but somehow I made it. So I know he got a bigger play for me and I got to focus on that. Mental connection to me is like everything. You know what I'm saying? Like that's where it stops and it ends for me. You know what I'm saying? And with me and Hov, mentally we was connected because even if we wasn't doing music, we would rock with each other in a sense because we both have old souls and we both came from the same struggle. But the only thing is his struggle started before mine and he started walking his path before me. So I have to look at somebody like that, how I would look at somebody in the hood who was already getting money before I was. I'm like, how you, how you do this and stay out? You know the crazy thing, like me and Hold only talk about music. Rarely, like it's like rare, you know what I'm saying? It's like one of them one of the things, I, I remember riding with Hov one day from, I, we was in New York and we was doing something at the office. He was like, yo, come roll with me. And I, I got him back in the Maybach with him. And we was rolling he, and we was riding by Central Park. He's like, you know what? I've been here my whole life and I've never been to that place. And, and, and what I took from that is, he's so focused on, you know, doing and being what he is that something as peaceful as a park, he never took a minute to go over there and just enjoy that peace of mind. And that meant a lot to me because I'm looking at it like, that's something I strive for, I'm a Libra, so I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. But my past had so much turmoil, so much destruction and, and, and devastation in it that 
what I got from what he was saying is you 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 are who you are now. You know what I'm saying? But just because you are that, don't don't be afraid to have your peace. Right around the time, you know, we went on tour together. I had an incident happen when my whole crew got locked up. <laughs> so for the like the rest of the two, I was coming to do my show by myself. <laughs> I ain't had no stage manager, I ain't had no manager, I ain't had no no nothing. It was just me. And I was just show up. But in my mind, he was like, yo, you need to talk. I was just like, and he done did that a few times. Like when everybody, you know, I had some things going on the street where everybody got indicted and all these things were really happening and it was real, you know, the, the label turned their back on me. They did. They wouldn't pick up my calls. They wouldn't trying to hear what I was saying. And whole call me. He's like, yo, you need to talk on my office. And I went to his office and we just said, of course I can't say what he said, but we just talked. And I just walked out of there like, you know, that's why I really rock with him. You know what I'm saying? Me and Hold have been in some like, you know, a lot of people don't know, like we've been in some fish fights and everything. You know what I'm saying? Like, 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 you know, some things popped off in Vegas. God bless the dead, Shakir Stewart, my brother. And I gotta say, home got hands, cause me and him was getting down. We was back to back, you know what I mean? And I heard his assistant saying, Jay, get in the car. He was like, I ain't leaving Jeezy. I was like, yo, I rock with him. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we went through that. And um, you know, for me, I just respect somebody who who has enough respect for themselves not to lose their integrity to please people. You know what I'm saying? That's the biggest thing I see in him. You gotta have tough skin. You know, anybody can be an artist, anybody can be a rapper. But when you start talking about life changing and, and, and being in a position that, you know, most of us never thought would even be humanly possible and balancing all that and not losing yourself, you know what I'm saying? Like, that takes a special type of skin. And I think it's only a few of us that really have that, you know what I'm saying? Because it, it, you know, to be a leader is like that. You know, you're gonna take some hits. You know, people ain't gonna understand your vision. You know what I'm saying? Until it's time. A lot of people didn't see my vision, but they didn't know this is how I wanted to sit here. I mean, how many dicky suits can I own? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? One time I had a thousand pair of Chuck Taylors. Air Force One should have gave me some stock in there. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, it's like people don't want you to change. And it's just like, my, my vision is my vision. You know what I'm saying? How I see myself is how I see myself. You know what I mean? And how you see yourself, that's how you see yourself. And what you want to be, those are your goals and your dreams. So you can't knock mine because you want me to stay in a certain place so that you're comfortable with who you are. That, that's, it's, it's, it's more to life than that, you know what I mean? Like, you think Barack Obama just gonna be the president and he's done his whole way? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he ain't got nothing else he wants to do. It's like, you know what I mean? It don't work like that. Um, verses like this, like, you know, there's a lot to that story, you know what I mean? We can get into the street aspect of it, but it's no need. Verses was about the music. That's how I took it. You know, let's take them back there. Both of us rich now, like, we, you know, <laughs> we, we gonna kill each other on, on, on live stream? I mean, is, that, is that gonna do it? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, and I still ain't got no ill will. I know a lot of people sent back, like, you know, like, it went this way, it went that way, but the people who love me, love me. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I, I'm solid. Everybody know that. There ain't nothing to dispute. But, you know, a, a true act of bravery is being the first one to do something, stand on it with no regrets. Like, I don't got none. I still walk around my head high, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I still walk away with my integrity too. Because I'm coming up there and it's crazy. And I'm gonna say this, nobody heard me say that. Magic City was what I chose because that's what made me. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying like that building made me, protecting me. Magic is like my uncle I never had. I would never do anything to disrespect magic. But those walls made me who I am. That's why I felt the safest. That's why I felt the most confident. But the same person who helped build me there, DJ Fernando, was one of my friends, was actually killed. That really, you know, he's his soul is there. And if I'm honest, like I felt it when I walked in. You know, you know what to do. Don't nobody take you out of the square, man. Just do it right. And, 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 and that's it. And that's what I did. You know, I wouldn't thought I wouldn't plan I was just, that's how I felt. You know what I mean? So for me, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep my integrity. I'm going to stand on what I believe, you know? Yeah. You got to believe in what you stand on. And to me, it's just like, you know, it, it, it is what it is. It's music. 
You know what I'm saying? It's it's um it's culture. You know, I mean, you look at Ross. We we had misunderstandings that weren't even misunderstandings. You know what I'm saying? But when we sit down, we sit down as men. I respect that. You know what I'm saying? We worked that out. We sat in the room and chopped it up. Like, oh, you ain't say, oh, come on, man, I ain't no. You know what I mean? It, it got to that. But you'll be selfish to make it about you and not the culture. People want to see, you know, what they what they see. And I always go back to, you know, I know it might sound crazy, but do you know it would have been like a pocket big? You could have got a room and figured something out. You know, you know why our culture be in there? Because that's where it started from. That's where all this stemmed from that. You know, that's the, only, that's the only example we had. You know what I'm saying? So that's what we took out there. Even myself was like, I'm doing what Pac would have did. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, yeah, well, however you want to do this. You know, we can fight dogs, race cars, shoot guns. I'm down. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I had a chance to make a difference. And I just think if Pocket and Big could have gotten the room, our culture would probably be in a whole different place right now. My mom taught me a lot of things. She taught me to be fearless. She taught me to be a survivor. And of course, she gave me tough love, but it also gave me tough skin. And, you know, I strive every day. And, 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 and like I told her, you know, I'm gonna get you a house, mom. I got out of the trailer. I bought a, you know, two, three different houses, you know, to the last one I got it. Um, and my whole goal in life, you know what I'm saying, was to make her proud, you know, because I was the one that didn't graduate from school. But one thing that always stuck with me, and I should have said it earlier, is that my auntie told me um, back then that you got something a lot of people ain't got. And I was like, what's that? She's like, you're street smart. And that always stuck with me. And I think I got that from my mom, because my mom was very street savvy. And for me, you know, for her to see me live my dreams and, and, and achieve my goals and be at peace and be who I am as a, as a man, as a, as a solid man, the way she raised me, I'm at peace. You know what I'm saying? Because the only thing I do, do regret is when I was in the streets is that um, I gave myself an ultimatum meaning that I didn't really open my heart in ways that I could have as a son because I felt that if I detached myself, that if I went to prison or got killed, it would be easier for her. You see what I'm saying? In my, in my family. But here we go again. I'm going to show you God. When I got on my rap career and I started doing things and doing shows and things that I'd be proud of, she would be the first person to call me. It's like my sister showed me, you know, after she passed, all the magazine articles and all the things that she saved. But my rap career started and I figured out my life was the moment that I was able to really embrace my mother because I didn't have a fear of being taken away from her. You know what I'm saying? So that's how God works. He gives you things and he gives you people. So the only regret that I have is that time that I could have been what I was supposed to have been. I, 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 mentally, I wasn't there. But after that, like, our relationship was dope, you know what I'm saying, until she passed. And, you know, I think for the lost time, we made up a lot, you know. And, you know, I know my mom. She a fighter. Like, even when I get in there, I hear it. Like, boy, you better go figure that out. You better put your head up and your chest out. What you doing? And that's what I do because she raised me that way. And um, the morals she instilled in me, uh, I still use them to this day, for sure. I want to lead by example. I want to do and be everything that I ever thought I could be, because I don't ever want to wake up one day and, and live with regrets. I don't want to be that guy, you know, on my deathbed saying, if only I had more time, I maybe would have tried this, I might would have tried that. And for me, I'm all about giving back. So the more I have, the more I'm able to get back to my people, back to my community, just showing people from my walk of life and from the streets that the sky is really the limit. Like, you really can be what you inspire to be if you really have the discipline, make the sacrifices, and, 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 and live with integrity. It's all these different things, and you got to fight through it. And if anything, I just want to be the poster child for the have-nots. You know what I'm saying? I want to be the guy to say, you know, Jeezy did it. 
because they saw me on the block with them, you know? Mentally, for me, I'm just thirsty. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just have a thirst for knowledge. And one thing that I realized early on, because I thought my story was, like, just the illness. Like, I've been through this. You never know. You know, with the woo, with that, all this stuff. And I had to sit back and look at people who even made it legitimately. Like, they've been through hell, you know? And they learned a lot of things along the way. So I want to show my culture that it's okay to learn and not be the smartest person in the room and at the same time, share the knowledge. The, the message is to put yourself in such a position that people don't mind having a conversation with you and giving you the knowledge. And the goal was to get this knowledge, because I still need it, but to share it with the culture at the same time. So instead of me taking it for myself and saying, I'm gonna keep building this, like, yo, he gonna talk to me, but that means talking to us. It's like everybody got a story, you know what I'm saying? It ain't just the monetary story, I'm just saying. Everybody went through the nose and the people telling them not. Like, even for me to talk to Steve Harvey, tell me, like, he's sleeping in his car. I, I ain't never slept in the car. Even if I did, I was trapping. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying? Like, I, I ain't never, like, slept in the car because I ain't had nowhere to stay. So I'm just like, how did that feel? Like, what, what, what did that, what did that, what kind of fire did that build in you? And I think, you know, Everybody has a story about adversity. And for me, like, I just want to hear it so I can learn from it, but I also want to share it with my people. I'm a God-fearing man that has purpose, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and just understands that it's always more to life and it's always room to grow. And you're never going to know everything. And I've been through some things, but I'm not afraid to heal. I'm not afraid to learn. I'm not afraid to understand. I'm not afraid to express myself. You know what I'm saying? And to me as a father, you know, you have some fathers that are, you know, uh, professors at college and can really give their kids, you know, uh, advice about that. Or my kids get from me how to be genuinely you, how to be genuinely solid, how to be fearless, how to how to take care of your people, um, and how to always be a forward thinker, and definitely how to be God-fearing. But at the same time, I always how to believe in yourself. You know, I always want to lead by example. I, I tell my kids all the time, um, don't 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 listen to what nobody say. Watch what they do, and that's what I want them to do with me too. Watch what I do. I came from the street, so I'm always going to... I, I tell my kids all the time, no matter what you do, watch your surroundings. That's, that's how I'm wired. But if you ask me what real happiness is to me, it's being at a place of peace. You know what I'm saying? At a place of understanding who you are, your wrongs and your rights, and everything around you being, being of love, like meaning like I, I keep people that love me around. Because at one time, there's people around me that probably if they could have, you know what I'm saying, would have probably knocked me off if they had a chance, you know what I'm saying? These are people that was in my circumference, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I really came from that life, you know what I'm saying? And I had to go through all those steps. Like, I'll tell you, like, I borrowed $20 from my uncle to get started with what I was doing in the streets, and I never looked back, you know what I'm saying? So imagine that, all that time and that work and that energy and staying safe and staying out of jail and staying alive to now, and it's just like, if you ask me, at the end of the day, I don't do anything that doesn't bring me peace. I don't. I, I, I just can't do it. I'm about balance. <laughs> I'm gonna balance those things. I'm gonna grind hard, but I'm gonna make sure that I play harder. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna have big, big goals, but at the same time, I'm gonna have goals to take care of myself. Like mentally, I'm gonna sit down and have the conversations with people that I need to have just to have understanding. Because you know, it's people that's so far ahead of me. And you know, if you sit down with them, they just tell you the secrets, you know what I'm saying? Or just make you understand, you know, the things that's gonna keep you in this game and keep jeopardy, because it ain't just about music. We all bigger than rap if we wanna be. We all bigger than rap if we wanna be, you know? <laughs>